Welcome to From the Front Lines, Surgeon's Voices for the ACS Bulletin Brief, Dr. Kelly Hunt. Dr. Hunt is the Hamill Foundation Distinguished Professor and Chair of Breast Surgical Oncology at MD Anderson in Texas. Welcome, Dr. Hunt. Thank you. Happy Very to glad, be here. I'm glad to have you here. And I've enjoyed working with you the last several years in the ACS cancer programs. Um, I have a, some understanding, I think, of what you're doing with the Alliance, which is an incredible, important work. But I'd like you to review some of that work, the background of the Alliance, how it came to be and what it does, because I'm, I'm not sure all of our listeners and viewers are involved in the realm of cancer and, and understand the importance of the program which you run. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I'd be happy to describe that. The NCI restructured all of the cooperative groups about a decade ago now. It's hard to believe it's been that long. And and they coalesced in, in some of the groups. So the American College of Surgeons Oncology group partnered with CALGB and NCCTG in order to form the Alliance for Clinical Trials in Oncology. And so, um, you know, all of the work that was being done in ACASOG through the different disease site programs moved into the Alliance. And as part of that uh, merger, it became clear that there were a lot of other potential uh, avenues for research, that, especially that surgeons were interested in cancer care delivery research, um, dissemination and implementation, cancer care standards development, and so on. And, and so the program within the alliance that was developed that you're now well aware of is the American College of Surgeons Cancer Research Program, formerly called the Clinical Research Program. So that program was formed within the alliance and is essentially a collaboration across the alliance and the American College of Surgeons Cancer Programs. And within that, we get to, as you know, work with all of the other cancer programs very closely but we're also very heavily invested in the research side of things within the Alliance for Clinical Trials in Oncology. Thanks, that, that's very helpful to understand. Now within the cancer programs, there are basically six programs, the National Cancer Database, the AJCC, uh, the, the Alliance is, as just described, clinical research programs, of course, uh, then the three accrediting programs, the Commission on Cancer, the National Accreditation Program for Breast Centers, the National Accreditation Program for Rectal Cancer. The interface um, between the National Cancer da Database and the uh, clinical research programs is a very important one. Uh, the, the accreditation programs put their data in. What happens after that? Perhaps you could give us some examples of how your group has proven value using the NCDB. There are a lot of different investigators across the, the U.S., obviously, that utilize the NCDB for different studies. One of the things that we focused on was looking at some of the operative standards that were developed in the Cancer Care Standards Development Committee, operative standards um, for different specific disease sites, critical elements of an operation that are performed you know, during the conduct of an oncologic procedure, and um, looking specifically at some, the operative standards for breast cancer and the operative standards for gastric cancer, um, some of our investigators looked at cohorts of patients in NCDB to see when the operative standards were followed and what difference it made in outcomes. And in fact, what they found was that especially in breast cancer and gastric cancer, there was a clear improvement in survival outcomes when the operative standards were followed as part of patient care. Well, that, that's indeed a very important finding uh, for people to understand. So at least in a couple of cancers, uh, gastric, uh, what are some of the others? The first volume of the operative standards for cancer surgery included breast, colon, lung, and pancreas cancer. Volume two expanded into gastric, uh, rectal cancer, thyroid, uh, melanoma, and, um, and then volume three is in development. Now that includes some of the disease sites that are less common, sarcoma, peritoneal surface malignancies, hepatobiliary, and some others. Are the volumes available for those who don't know they can get them through the college? 
they're available through uh, yeah the volume one and volume two. You can uh, you can definitely get those if you look on the website, the college website, uh, cancer programs under the cancer research program. It's um, it's featured there, and you can certainly purchase those volumes. Uh, they're they're really um, you know we're really excited about them because they're going beyond just being a published material to actually now, as you know, being uh, the standards are being taken out of those volumes and being put into the accreditation uh, as part of some of the the cancer programs, the Commission on Cancer. So we're we're very excited about that transition just from a research perspective of looking at evidence-based standards and publishing those to actually now putting them into practice. And then, of course, you know, as part of the newest program, the Cancer Surgery Standards Program, making operative reports, synoptic operative reports that actually clearly delineate those standards and, the diff and how to uh, document that in your operative record. Excellent and important work. And in fact, we, we spoke with Arden Morris on this series about synoptic operative reports and, and got some very valuable information uh, from her. Ultimately, the data that are housed in the NCDB and subsequently analyzed in, in, in research are derived from individual accredited programs at the level of the tumor boards. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed the way we, we meet with each other and changed the way we yes, uh, conduct education, uh, whether it's something like this occurring remotely rather than us sitting together in the same space at, at the annual clinical Congress or at the Quality and Safety Congress. Uh, so instead we're, we're remote. Can you tell us a little bit about what's happened with tumor boards uh, during this, this uh, crisis and how, how your group has, has helped people? I think tumor boards are actually being utilized more frequently now as we're having to look at which patients really need to be taken care of um, in the midst of the pandemic, who can, whose surgeries can be delayed, when is neoadjuvant therapy most appropriate. So I think most of us are actually really excited about uh, sharing all of these different things with our other participants in the tumor board. So one of the things that um, the dissemination implementation committee for the cancer research program started doing several years ago was taking information from completed clinical trials and making a, um, a tool uh, to help disseminate that information through a very short video that could be played at a tumor board so that all of the different disciplines are, are there at the same time hearing the same information, um, the key points from the clinical trial. Um, and then they also developed a, a survey tool that they gave to some of the Commission on Cancer accredited facilities at their tumor boards before they watched the video and then again after they watched the video and trying to understand what the knowledge base was about some of these trials that were recently published and whether there were barriers to implementation, why there might be barriers. And then after seeing the video, assessing how useful that was in terms of getting everyone on the same page and being able to implement trials in, into practice. And, you know, that's one of the things that we always worry about with research and clinical trials and translational medicine in general is that it takes so long for things to, to get to the front lines and for people to um, really figure out within their own system, how do they get these things into practice? So these have been really great little tools and they're now actually for, for breast cancer, we have one that's on the uh, college website on the Learning Management Center that can be utilized by um, anyone who wants to. It doesn't have to be a specific, uh, you know, facility, um, but anyone who wants to can can access that information. And then Caitlin Kelly at uh, University uh, UCSD is is doing a similar thing with gastric cancer, um, looking at staging. What type of staging uh, is appropriate, and what type of nodal dissection is appropriate for different patients and trying to um, really disseminate that information through these little um, packets that can be provided to tumor boards. 
And I think it's great because, again, you know, at a tumor board, you have the surgeons, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, the nurses are there, you know, pathologists and others so that imaging, everyone's on the same page in terms of what is, uh, what's important for that, that patient's care. That, that, that's excellent. Um, it, it sounds from what you're saying that even after the pandemic, some of these virtual tumor boards may continue to have a role. I think so. I mean, I personally, I can say that it, it, I'm able to get to the tumor board a lot more readily now because I don't have to run from one building to another. You know, I can just pull out my laptop and, and open it up and, and join from wherever I am in the hospital facility. So I think having some things remain virtual will be a benefit to participation through those important meetings. Speaking of meetings, the last question I'll, I'll touch on is, is there are two in fairly rapid succession, the Quality and Safety Conference and, and the Annual Clinical Congress. Um, are you planning any sessions? Will there be any sessions for the fellows uh, at either or both of those meetings that will help them learn about some of these new programs and implementation of those programs, value of those programs at their individual hospitals? Yeah, so actually we do have at the Quality and Safety meeting, we have a session on operative standards for breast surgery, and then also one for, um, for colon, for colon cancer. So I think that um, there's two sessions coming up on that. And then at the Clinical Congress, uh, we have a couple different educational sessions that are being offered by uh, the, the Cancer Research Program, and, and those are all available on our website um, we don't have the timing of that, obviously, just yet, because that's still being transitioned from the planned in-person meeting to now a virtual meeting. But we, and we also were planning a course that was going to be a, a full-day course on how do uh, surgeons get involved in the type of research? How do you develop standards? What type of methodologies do you need? What type of training? Um, you know, who are your partners from the different disciplines? And, and so, and how do you put them into practice through individual hospitals, through hospital systems? How do you educate trainees, you know, medical students, residents, fellows, and so on? So we have a, a whole course plan for that as well. Sounds like wonderful educational content, which is really a, a, a tremendous complement to all of the work going on behind the scenes. And I suspect many more fellows will want to get engaged uh, in, in, in your programs and, and participate in the great work you're doing. Thank you very much for spending uh, a little bit of time with us on From the Front Lines. Uh, I'm sure our viewers and listeners are going to benefit from what you've had to say. Thanks so much for having me. Great seeing you. Likewise. Hope it's in person one of these days. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> great. Thank you.